Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Center for the Study of the Administrative State here at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Welcome all of you here, and as welcome as well to all of our guests watching online, either now or someday in the future. Um, and more specifically, welcome to our discussion today on free speech and the administrative state. Now, those of you who have come to our programming before know that the center's programs break down roughly into three categories. First of all, we do research and conferences on traditional doctrines of administrative law, sort of core administrative law, things like Chevron deference, or our last conference a few weeks ago, uh, titled Beyond Deference, where we examined other emerging issues in judicial review of agency action. The second sort of category of things we do here is to zero in on a subject matter, a particular regulatory subject matter. So our program on environmental law regulation, our program on financial regulation. And this falls into the third category of things we do here, where we took look at the intersection of public administration and other constitutional or governmental principles that uh, intersect or collide with uh, current issues in public regulation and administration. And so for this program on First Amendment free speech and the administrative state, we thought we would take both broad looks and more focused looks at aspects of free speech uh, in modern regulation. Now, often we think about this in terms of the FCC and its regulation of speech or campaign finance regulation of speech. Uh, one of the things I'm very much looking forward to today are discussions of other sort of understudied areas of speech regulation. And so, uh, Thank you all for joining us today for asking good questions. And I'd also encourage you to take a look on the website for this event where all of the papers that were written for this conference are available online in PDF form. Some very interesting papers and I'd encourage you to take a look. And one last thing before we begin, I do want to extend a special thanks to my friend Jonathan Adler, professor of law at Case Western University School of Law. Jonathan co-planned this event. He actually came up with the idea for it along with Naomi Rao and she was still running the center before she went on to, to join the administration. And so thank you very much, Jonathan, for everything you've done to create this event, uh, work through the, the original private roundtable and workshop where we kick these papers around. And now uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. And with that, let me turn this over to my colleague, Michael Grieva, professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, author of such books as the Upside Down Constitution, uh, and no shortage of articles. Michael, if you will, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Adam has eaten now uh, into three minutes of my time, which I will ruthlessly append to the duration of this panel. I will further economize uh, on, on the time here and make as much time as we can for audience participation discussion on this terrific panel by dispensing with any elaborate introduction of our illustrious speakers. The bios are in your program. We'll do this in the following order. Uh, Professor Reddish, Mar Marty Reddish, wrote the basic, I mean, the principal paper for this panel, so he will go first. And then Jonathan Adler, and David Vladek, and Colleen Klasmeyer. Marty, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me see if my technical skills work here. Yes, they do. I begin my paper with an analysis of the theory of procedural due process because the concept of procedural due process is basically foundational to the democratic system. You can look at it on two levels. On, on one purely utilitarian level, the goal of procedural due process is to bring about an accurate result, and only if we have accurate results can we reach efficient ends. But to me, more important, are the dignitary values that underlie it. Part of the implicit social contract in a liberal democratic society is, is the provision that government show respect for the individual and treat the individual with the dignity that he or she deserves as a, a citizen in a, in a democratic state. And that renders procedural due process one of the most vital of constitutional protections. Of the different elements of procedural due process, the foundational element, the sine qua non of procedural due process is a neutral adjudicator. If you don't have a neutral adjudicator, if you have a, an adjudicator who comes with an ex-ante uh, developed 
bias in one way or another. Then whatever else you provide, uh, right to cross-examine accusers, right to counsel, whatever, none of it matters because the decision isn't going to be based on what happens in the proceeding. Um, the origins of the requirement of a neutral adjudicator go all the way back to Lord Cook in Dr. Bonham's case when he said no man can be a judge in his own case. And we have extrapolated that out to no man who is controlled by one of the litigants can be a judge in that litigant's case. The Supreme Court uh, has a very established doctrine on this subject when it applies to the courts. In Toomey versus Ohio in 1927, the court was reviewing a decision of a judge who handed out traffic convictions and received a certain amount of every fine that he issued. There was no showing that the judge had done anything improper or that any decision by the judge was anything but uh, perfectly legitimate. But the court ruled this unconstitutional as a violation of procedural due process because the standard was, does the arrangement create a possible temptation to the average man as a judge? Note the word possible. There is no requirement that there be a showing of impropriety. We err on the side of overprotection. It's what I call the risk of the wrong guess. If we're going to have to risk being wrong one way or the other, we'd rather risk being wrong by overprotecting than, under, than underprotecting. And the court has applied this, this standard consistently. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, Williams versus Pennsylvania, they, they continued to uh, apply this, this standard. Now in the paper, my co-author and I um, develop a taxonomy of interferences. And some of them are, are pretty obvious and some of them maybe aren't. Coercive interference, if, if the adjudicator feels under threat of physical violence, loss of, loss of his or her job, reduction of salary, something like that, then neutrality doesn't exist. Incentivized decision making. Well, that was to me. Do you get a benefit by coming out one way or the other? Um, associative and disassociative prejudices. Well, this can best be illustrated by a, a case uh, in Ray Murchison in 1955 where the Supreme Court held it violated due process for a judge who had held someone in contempt in his courtroom to adjudicate the actual contempt trial. He had brought to the, the matter a prejudice that would prevent him from being a truly neutral adjudicator. And it, when it comes to federal agencies, both the incentivized decision making and the associative and disassociative prejudices are serious problems when members of the very agency that bring the action sit as the ultimate adjudicators on the merits of that, that claim. Uh, those involved in an agency have a, a special allegiance to it. And that's understandable. It's a kind of cognitive dissonance that leads to what psychologists call motivated reasoning. Uh, it seems much more self-evident to me than uh, scholars who make it into a detailed theory. It's just you're going to cherry pick for your side. Do we know all agencies are going to do that? Of course not. But again, if we applied the standard from Toomey, a possible temptation, there's no doubt that members of the same commission should not be making a final decision on the merits of a proceeding brought by that, that very commission. Think of it this way. If an individual were tried in the U.S. Attorney's Office by the U.S. Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office was the adjudicator, and they, are, and they said, no, 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 there's, there's a wall between the adjudicatory branch of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the, and the branch br bringing the case, you think that would be constitutional? 
Do you think it would be constitutional, putting aside all Article Three issues, just as a matter of due process? I have no doubt that it wouldn't be. Yet that's what we do in agencies all the time. But in 1975, the Supreme Court decided when one of the really most embarrassingly badly reasoned decisions I've ever seen, Withrow versus Larkin. It dealt with the constitutionality of a state administrative body in Wisconsin. Uh, and the Supreme Court said all of a sudden, not even mentioning the whole Toomey line of cases as applied to judges, there's no reason to question the honesty of administrators. So with judges, they basically say, um, we have to assume that they're going to act improperly, even if they won't, for purposes of appearance of fairness and risk of the wrong guess. With administrators, somehow, how dare we suggest that, that they, they might be biased. And then the court says, the procedure used here complied with the Administrative Procedure Act, which of course wasn't even relevant because this was a state case. But the court seemed to be forgetting eighth grade civics, which tells you that a statute that doesn't satisfy the Constitution is unconstitutional. The statute does not trump the Constitution. The only way to rationally explain Withrow versus Larkin, I think, is in terms of the theory of Bruce Ackerman of Yale called the constitutional moment. Bruce Ackerman says the New Deal was a constitutional moment where we all sort of held hands and had a great consensus and the Constitution magically changed, changed somehow ignoring Article V amendment process. And as a result, the Constitution doesn't restrict the New Deal. If you want to accept that kind of approach, then maybe this makes sense. Otherwise, I see no reason why we wouldn't treat administrators with the same level of inherent, untargeted but inherent suspicion that we treat judges' independence. One minute. Oh, <laughs> Well, there are ways to uh, solve the problem, I think, but as I dis discuss in the paper, but I recognize, you know, I, that, it, that it might be impractical to, at this late date to change the, the whole system. I, you know, I'm in uh, an ivory tower, but I can still understand the realities. But that doesn't mean we can't at least narrowly describe certain enclaves of, air, of authority where we are inherently suspicious, where the Constitution is used to challenge the uh, regulatory authority of the agency. There, there is no way you can trust the agency's decision-making power. And the area where I would specifically do this is in the area of what Henry Monaghan many years ago called First Amendment due process. Why s separate out First Amendment? Because it's important. It's more important than other things. As Alexander Mickeljohn said, the free speech springs from the principles of democratic government. You can't have democracy without free speech. Yet it's fragile. Speakers are often willing to forego it uh, because they are uh, discouraged or threatened. And there is a serious chilling effect. Uh, on, on speakers who fear that they won't get their rights protected and might be punished for, for what they say. Uh, so what the paper ends up recommending is that in the area of First Amendment due process, the entire agency process be circumvented at the option of the regulated party. If the regulated party prefers to go through the administrative process first, it can, but that if there is a legitimate First Amendment challenge, and everything filed in federal court is controlled by Rule 11, so there it uh, can't be used just as a delaying tactic, it is important to get the First Amendment rights determined uh, at the outset, before the administrative process uh, can deal with the regulatory issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muddy. Don't tell me you have a slideshow. What? I do not have a slideshow. Great. No slideshow. Um, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be back here uh, and to 
be with you this morning to talk about free speech in the administrative state. Uh, what I'd like to do <clears throat> is uh, look at an example of an area where uh, the existing way we approach the regulation of product claims uh, not only raises the sorts of constitutional concerns uh, that Marty is concerned about, but also uh, has the threat of undermining uh, the very purposes for which we engage in regulation in the first place. That is to say, uh, regulation of truthful health claims uh, not only uh, is problematic as a constitutional matter, the way it is currently done, uh, but also has the potential to undermine the protection of public health. And the example I'm going to talk about, which is, which is one that I've written about, and I have a paper uh, focusing on the policy aspects of this that's about to come out uh, in the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty, uh, is the regulation of electronic cigarettes and other alternative tobacco products, where under current law, uh, if manufacturers or producers make truthful health claims, indeed, if they do something as simple as quote the FDA, uh, they are uh, not only subject to regulation, but it, should they do so without the FPA, FDA's prior permission uh, are engaged uh, in violating the law merely by stating those claims. Uh, and this is constitutionally problematic, as well as being harmful uh, to public health. Now, one justification for this sort of regulation that's often put forward is that, well, what we're really doing is regulating conduct. When, for example, a manufacturer of a product makes certain sorts of health claims, that changes the nature of the product that they are offering, that changes uh, what they are engaged in. Uh, and historically, this has been an argument for why this sort of regulation should not be subject to the sort of First Amendment scrutiny we might uh, adopt in other consequences. Uh, I don't think that sort of argument works, uh, and I think it's been fairly conclusively rejected by the Supreme Court most recently in the Expressions Hair Design case, where the court made very clear that if what determines how an action of, the, of a producer or a seller is regulated is what the producer or vendor says, then First Amendment scrutiny is appropriate. So in that case, uh, there was a question about a regulation of pricing of products, in particular, uh, whether or not a retailer could charge different prices for a credit card transactions as opposed to cash transactions. And as the court noted, certainly uh, the government can regulate prices. Uh, but if what triggers or what differentiates the lawful action from the unlawful action is not the price differential, but the way that price differential is described, that is the speech that is used by the seller, then the First Amendment applies. And the problem with, uh, at least the way uh, on the posture the case came to the court, with the New York regulation at issue is that what differentiated a lawful pricing regime from an unlawful pricing regime was not whether or not there was a price differential, but whether or not it was described as a surcharge or as a discount. I, I think the same thing applies, you know, the court's language is, is quite clear here. If what differentiates, for example, a deemed tobacco product that is lawful uh, under the Tobacco Act and FDA regulations uh, it, is uh, if what determines whether or not it's simply a deemed tobacco product or, for example, a drug or device is the way the manufacturer or producer describes the product in question, then that regulatory regime is subject to First Amendment scrutiny. And that is, in fact, uh, what is occurring currently uh, under the FDA's existing regulations and the Tobacco Act uh, that was adopted by Congress. Now, I should be clear, and, and you know, we, there may be in, in, on, in some of our panels uh, and, and uh, and some of the papers point the fingers at the agencies, and certainly Marty's paper talks about the incentives faced by the agencies. I should be clear that in this particular context, some of the problem uh, is not the fault of the FDA, uh, but the fault of Congress that enacted a statutory regime that forces the agency uh, to uh, impose severe constraints on producers based on what they say about their products. So for example, under the Tobacco Act, if a producer of a deemed tobacco product wants to make truthful health claims about their product, say something like, uh, this contains less nicotine, or uh, eat an electronic cigarette is a healthier alternative to smoking traditional cigarettes, then uh, in order to make such a claim, that product must be approved as a modified risk tobacco product. And that's written into the statute itself. <clears throat> 
What that means in practice is, is that were a producer to simply take a statement by the FDA and put it on their package, put it in their advertising, a statement from the FDA such as uh, the inhalation of nicotine uh, without the products of combustion is of less risk to the user than the inhalation of nicotine delivered by uh, uh, <clears throat> the inhalation of nicotine without the products of combustion is of less risk to the user than the inhalation of nicotine delivered by smoke from combusted tobacco products. Uh, they, doing so, simply quoting that statement, uh, is unlawful unless the product is is approved first as a modified uh, risk. Uh, tobacco products. Similarly, uh, it were a producer to simply quote the FDA saying, several studies support the notion that the quantity of toxicants in an electronic cigarette vapor is significantly less than those in tobacco cigarettes and tobacco smoke and similar to those contained in recognized nicotine replacement therapies, a conclusion that was, I should note, was also uh, reached by the National Academy of Sciences report that was issued this week. A producer simply stating that uh, would be uh, violating the law, would be, would be guilty of selling a modified risk tobacco product uh, without the government's approval. Uh, and that's a function of the statute. Uh, the, F the way the FDA has interpreted its regulatory authority, though, has, has gone farther because the FDA has said that should an electronic cigarette manufacturer make claims about the ability to use such products to reduce or quit smoking, then that instantly transforms the electronic cigarette into a drug or device because any claim about smoking cessation, according to the FDA, is a therapeutic claim about the treatment of a disease, the disease being nicotine addiction, and therefore, before a producer could make any of those sorts of claims, again, claims that the FDA itself has made, uh, and, 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 and merely quote statements the FDA has put in the Federal Register, uh, that that would be, a, would be unlawful. And that's based on the FDA's broad interpretation of what makes something uh, a, drug or, a drug or device. This has, again, not only constitutional implications, but it has severe public health implications. While there is still a substantial amount of uncertainty about the long-term effects of elect use of electronic cigarettes, there is no real dispute that electronic cigarettes expose users to far less risk than the use of traditional cigarettes, largely because of the lack of combustion. Uh, the NAS report uh, talks to some degree about this. The report of, of uh, uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, United Kingdom equivalent, has talked about this. But what we know is that encouraging smokers to switch to electronic cigarettes uh, has the potential to dramatically reduce the death toll and disease uh, impacts uh, associated with smoking. And yet producers can't tell users of this fact under the existing regulatory regime. One justification for this is, well, they might be misled. And we certainly should be concerned about consumer uh, confusion about the relative risks posed by different products that can be used to satisfy nicotine cravings. The problem is, is that the plurality of consumers think that electronic cigarettes are as, if not more dangerous, than cigarettes. That is to say, insofar as consumers are presently misled, they are misled in the opposite direction. And there is reason to suspect that the FDA regulation of electronic cigarettes, as well as statements by public health agencies, combined with the inability of producers to offer uh, 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 truthful statements about their products to counter that, has fed this misperception. So preventing producers from being allowed to make truthful claims about their products is encouraging an informational environment in which consumers, and smokers in particular, don't understand the sorts of actions they could take to address their smoking addiction and, in some cases, save their lives. And I think this underlines why not only should we be concerned about the First Amendment implications of these sorts of regulatory regimes, we should also be concerned about their practical implications on things like public health. Thank you. Thank you, Nala. David. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I think most lawyers can't think sitting down, so. <laughs> um, first, let me thank Michael and Jonathan and Adam, the, uh, the people who put this conference together. I really appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning. I, I have a confession to make. I think I've been on every side of every commercial speech uh, issue. Um, I spent many years at Public Citizen Litigation Group, got there right after Virginia Pharmacy Board. I co-authored the briefs in Zatterer, 
I handled Edenfield uh, versus Fain from the district court all the way through the Supreme Court. So, I, and uh, at the FTC, I don't think I had a single deception case in which the principal defense wasn't the First Amendment. No matter how fraudulent the product was, we had one guy who claimed that putting a bunch of magnets under the bottom of your car turned every car into a hybrid. His principal defense was the First Amendment. So Marty's Eden is my dystopia. Um, and let me just talk a little about the court's reticence, first of all, to even recognize that commercial speech was entitled to protection. And then when it did, carved out from First Amendment protection speech that's false, misleading, or deceptive. And that is because fraud has been endemic in the American marketplace ever since the founding of the Constitution. And there is an enormous amount of uh, false and deceptive and misleading statements out in the marketplace. And so the court you know, was reluctant to come to the commercial speech doctrine. Marty was one of the first to call, I mean, Marty's call to action in 1971, I think was, was an important moment. Uh, Marty doesn't get enough credit. I think now he probably wants to run away from it. The only thing we agree on. Well, <laughs> I want to give you credit. No, we agree on a couple of other things, um, but not much. Um, so I think you have to approach this subject with an understanding that there are genuine concerns about false, misleading, and deceptive speech in the marketplace and the serious impact it has on the market. If, if, uh, if companies are allowed to engage in false and mis misleading statements, it crowds out and sets an unlevel playing field that those companies who want to sort of stick by the facts are deeply disadvantaged in the marketplace, as are consumers. So, the first concern I have with Marty's paper is that it really misunderstands the nature of the administrative process. Uh, it, it has self-interested regulators, uh, you know, looking for cases, looking for scalps. It, 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 it suggests that the commission itself is deeply involved in investigations and enforcement cases. None of that really is true. At the Federal Trade Commission, the commission's only responsibility before a case is fully adjudicated is to approve a complaint. The complaint is generated by the staff. It is submitted to the commission with a memo that, that explains why we think there's reason to believe that there's been a violation of the FTC Act. The commission then votes on it, as it does on hundreds of matters each year. Once that vote takes place, the commission has nothing whatsoever to do with the investigation and the prosecution. We have an ALJ. Yes, the ALJ does principally uh, FTC cases, but I'll tell you this, my won and loss record in federal district court was much higher before the, than our ALJ. Our ALJ stuck to the law. He was a tough guy. He is a tough guy. Uh, we lost a lot of cases before the ALJ. Under Marty's regime, that would be unthinkable. We lost some important cases, and the Palm case, which Marty uses as his template, is a particularly good example of that. One of the things that you have to understand about administrative agencies is that the remedies they can impose are far less severe than what a district court can do. So the FTC can't fine a company. It can impose redress orders that require consumer redress. Those are equitable remedies that can, uh, that can be um, ordered by a court. So if I wanted to do redress in the Palm case, if I wanted Palm to pay back to consumers the inflated cost they paid because they thought they were drinking a pomegranate juice that might prevent them from heart disease or heart attacks or other forms of, you know, other forms of illness, uh, I couldn't do that uh, in an administrative proceeding. I could have done that in district court. Um, and so one of the reasons why most of the FTC's cases are filed in district court these days is generally we want to shut down fraudsters immediately. And second, we want to get consumer redress. In Palm, I wanted the court, the, the commission, and then the DC Circuit to establish clear guidance on substantiation. So we brought this case before the agency not to coerce POM. If we had done that in district court, the sanctions could have been quite severe. We did it because we wanted to make law. And 
Uh, and so, the, uh, so and, and, and as Marty points out, prior to our filing an administrative complaint, Palm ran into district court and asked essentially for an injunction. Right? They wanted to stop the administrative proceeding, get an injunction, and proceed in court. Well, one difference is we got a trial in Palm in six months. The company was ready, we were, we were ready. If we wanted to try the case in, de in, in a district court, it would have taken years. And so one problem is there are very significant differences in the judicatory mechanism in regulatory agencies than there are in the district courts. Um, but, you know, under Marty's theory, that case should have been litigated in district court. It would have taken years. The sanctions that would have been available to the FTC would have been far more, uh, far more rigorous than they were before the agency. And um, it's not all clear to me Palm would have been better off. Um, we had a three-month trial before the ALJ. Palm got to make its record. The case then went to the commission. The commission did not order the all of the relief that the staff asked for, much to my disappointment. And then the case went to the DC Circuit, which upheld pretty much across the board the central issue in the case, which was, did uh, Palm have substantiation for the health claims it was making? And the DC Circuit, a panel that included Doug Ginsburg, who I think still teaches here, right? Doug is here. Uh, just completely rejected Palm's arguments. Um, so what, what's the message from that? Is this the administrative process run amok with self-interested regulators trying to, uh, you know, s stick it to the companies? If I wanted to stick it to Palm, we would have been in federal court. Um, so I, I just, the, the story doesn't hold. And the idea that you'd only lit litigate significant First Amendment challenges, which is Marty's, you know, Marty's test, what the heck is that? You don't know going in what claims are significant or not. And how far does Marty's test go? Suppose the investigation was going on by the US Attorney's Office for a criminal case and not a civil enforcement agency. Under Marty's due process theory, the, uh, the company ought to still be able to run into district court and get an injunction. And so I, I just, you know, Apart from the fact that most of these arguments have been rejected by the Supreme Court, I just don't see where that's going. Um, One minute. Okay, let me, uh, since I have three people to respond to, let me just talk about off-label use. I know Colleen's gonna talk about that. Um, the, the problem with off-label use is the same problem with POM. It allows sellers of health products to make claims for which there is not adequate substantiation. We've seen this movie in 1906 when the first Food and Drug Act was passed. We saw it again in 1938. We saw it in 1962 when the effectiveness standards were at, added to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The problem is that if you let people make claims for which there is no substantiation, you once again pollute the marketplace in ways that are gonna be inimical to consumer health and unfair to competitors who are not making these kinds of claims. Uh, if you want a well-functioning marketplace, particularly when you have the public health at stake, there needs to be some regulatory control over what is true and what is not true. And the idea that, a, that, that market actors like drug companies get to decide for themselves when it is they can make claims that have not been established to the FDA satisfaction jeopardizes us all. And so I understand there are, there are problems with drug development. I understand that the, uh, in some areas like oncology, it gets very difficult to swiftly approve important medications, but off-label promotion is not the answer. And at some point, I'll have a minute to talk about John's paper. Thanks so much. Absolutely. a little early, so I'm glad for the softball, David. <laughs> um, I thought I was going to have to start off on a completely different footing. Uh, the debate about off-label use is um, long-standing and one that I've lived with in private practice for a long time. Um, and it often ends up being 
um, disputed in the terms that David just used. Uh, the, the, the policy conversation about off-label use is not about whether manufacturers are constitutionally entitled to self-determine the accuracy or permissibility of speech that's false or fraudulent. It's, it's not. That would be an easy policy conversation to have. And if that were the question, we would have had resolution of it a long time ago, and indeed I think we did in 1906 under a predecessor statute. Um, the hard conversation to have, and the one that I've spent a lot of gin and tonics pondering, <laughs> is how you calibrate a regulatory scheme that is consistent with a complex statute that's been amended well over 100 times it was, since it was enacted during the New Deal with an increasingly complicated constitutional environment that recognizes the speech rights of individuals and corporations increasingly equally, um, and how you also serve the public health need for the accurate and prompt flow of information to inform clinical and payment decisions that are extraordinarily consequential, far more so than most of the purchasing decisions that are at issue in, in a lot of these cases, and frankly, much more consequential than the decision whether to drink pomegranate juice. Um, the, the kinds of speech that we're talking about are things like the following. Um, assume a um, manufacturer does, an innovative manufacturer does a 500 patient clinical study of an existing product in breast cancer. Assume their product's already been approved for a different tumor type. Assume further that this is a robust registration quality study, meaning one that was designed in close cooperation with regulatory agencies globally, and that cost $500 million to conduct and that these 500 patients had to provide informed consent to participate in, and participated in out of a sense of altruism as much as any genuine hope that they themselves would benefit from the, the, the proposed product. If that phase three clinical study generates data that satisfies FDA's very high expectations for substantiation, why on earth would anyone assert that data from that study should not be disseminated far and wide through any available means to make sure that community oncologists who have a very hard time keeping up with the literature know as early as possible that there is this treatment available. Is it an off-label use? Yes. But 70% of patients who are suffering from some form of cancer or blood disorder are being treated with off-label uses, and I'm here to tell you those off-label uses are not experimental. They very quickly become incorporated into the armamentarium and become standard of care. Recognized in clinical practice guidelines, that are written by communities of clinicians, <laughs> professional societies like ASCO. That is how medicine is practiced in many, many areas, including especially oncology, but also pediatrics, where studies are just not done um, for ethical reasons primarily, but also for risk-related reasons, which is another conversation. Also psychiatry. Here's another example of the kind of speech that we're talking about. Again, not false, not fraudulent. Assume a company, an, innovation, an innovative company, conducts a study in 5,000 patients who suffer from intractable schizophrenia where the patients have pronounced negative symptoms. And it's another conversation why the negative symptoms matter, but in schizophrenia, negative symptoms have um, consequences, quality of life and other consequences, community consequences that are different from, from positive symptoms. So you really want to treat the negative symptoms. You have a manufacturer that does the study that plays by the rules, that generates the data, and you have an agency that just has a lot going on in the particular division that reviews psychiatry products. What could possibly be the rationale for not allowing that company to disseminate the data from that study? I mean, we have other regulatory provisions and statutory provisions that compel companies to register those clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov administered by the NIH. We have you know, Title VIII of a law that was enacted a few years ago that requires companies to post the results of their clinical trials on that website for all the world to see. We have an entire um, commercial enterprise in the form of medical and scientific journal publishers who vie for the exclusive right to publish the results of those studies. 
in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Association, New England Journal of Medicine, and all the specialty journals. Um, those are, those are money-making enterprises, and they impose embargo requirements on the companies to prevent the companies from sharing those, those data before the publication can be issued. This is not a system, the off-label use conversation is not a conversation about a system in which the manufacturers of the, the innovative companies are out there trying to disseminate false or fraudulent data to harm patients. That's just not what we're talking about. Again, if that's what we were talking about, it would be easy. Um, so let me move on to one of the other 27 points I wrote down while my, while my co-panelists were talking. In two um, minutes. I can, I can do it. I can do it. Um, in the case of FDA, we don't have ALJs who are really the slightest bit involved in evaluating these proposed claims. It's just not how the process works. You, um, you typically have um, a, a scenario in which a company wants to engage in speech, and it's, give, it's been given an initial determination by regulators that it can't. Um, very often, those initial determinations are based on reasons extrinsic to the quality of the data. So an example would be a clinical trial that was conducted, again, according to registration quality standards um, in Europe, and someone at FDA decides that there's a question whether the findings from that study are applicable to a U.S patient population. For example, maybe there's a difference in the standard of care. Maybe as in the case of Ticagrelor, which is a cardiac drug, there was some question about a region-by-region vari region variation in patient response that just causes a question to arise in the minds of the regulatory um, professionals about whether there's a, an applicability of the, the data to the U.S. patient population. Those reasons are those issues are extrinsic to the quality of the data themselves. When, when FDA concludes that if authoritatively that a study is of the requisite quality and the data are reliable, there is really no rationale for those data not to be disseminated. Involving an ALJ in those kinds of policy engagements between a company and the agency would, in my view, be tremendously helpful. Um, we don't have that. And, and the, the, this, the original sin in this entire regulatory scheme is the lag. Uh, my view is that FDA almost always gets it right. Over time, the iterative process that occurs in the agency results in a very, very sound um, final regulatory decision. Occasionally, do they have to go to the Second Circuit where all good, <laughs> whence all good decisions come in this area? Yes. But for the most part, the agency self-corrects. If there were an ALJ involved in the process, I suspect that those timelines could be truncated significantly. And you would have fewer patients deprived of access to very important clinical information while the agency is going through its process of evaluating a proposed claim. Thank you, Colleen. Um, um, I suspect that our panelists are desperate to respond to each other, and I will give them um, an opportunity to do so briefly. Um, it, and, and I have one sort of gentle uh, request. Marty's paper is about adjudication, not about uh, sort of First Amendment challenges to rulemaking proceedings uh, and the like. And if you don't mind, I mean, you know, say about as much about it as you want um, or as little about it. Um, it. But one of the themes of the contributions, I think, was how would this actually work? Um, uh, what Marty is interested in, I think, is um, an avoidance of institutional bias. That to him generally means an Article Three judge. And David's answer to that is, how on God's good earth is that supposed to work? That'll take years, and uh, it'll all be too complicated. And I wonder whether there are models out there that might sort of straddle um, this hurdle a little. What I have in mind is, the patent system, if your patent is denied, you can either sort of appeal that eventually to the federal circuit, um, which will exercise deferential review for these adjudicatory decisions, or else you can challenge it full scale, de novo, at your choice um, in the Eastern District of Virginia. That'll take a while, it's very expensive, but you get an unbiased judge, uh, and the system operates at the sort of plaintiff's own um, discretion or choice, maybe that's a model that, that one could think about. The alternative models, uh, in the 1930s, um, there were serious proposals to create an entire system of administrative courts, not Article III courts, but ALJs who are disconnected from any particular agencies so that they don't suffer from some of the biases 
um, uh, Marty suggested. I would just like to hear a little more about the, the sort of practicalities of how this system might actually institutionally um, work. That said, one more round responses, starting with Marty. Two minutes each. Uh, as I distill David's arguments, they come down to six of them. One, the agency isn't involved in the investigation, it's just the staff. Second, ALJs sometimes find against the agency. Third, we can't impose severe penalties on our own. Fourth, if we really wanted to hurt the regulated party, we'd file in court. Five, the D.C. Circuit ultimately rejected Palm Wonderful's First Amendment claim. And six, there's commercial fraud everywhere. Um, I, I think he's missed the point on a, on a, lot, of, uh, a lot of these critiques of my, my paper. I, I thought the staff was part of the agency. I mean, what does it say on their paycheck stubs? Uh, but it really doesn't matter. The fact remains the agency exists to regulate. A First Amendment challenge is a challenge to their very authority to regulate. It doesn't matter who's involved in the investigation. That ALJs sometimes fi find against the agency really doesn't mean a lot uh, because the agencies employ the ALJs. They have no independence protections at all. And I was once involved in a case in the 19, uh, late 1980s in, in the FTC where the ALJ ruled that the First Amendment protected the speech and the commission that had filed the proceeding then overruled the ALJ. Uh, so that's hardly a, a, a response to a First Amendment attack. We can't impose severe penalties. Well, the, the mayor's court in Toomey versus Ohio was imposing $10 fines and the Supreme Court thought that triggered procedural due process. That's not really a, a defense against the due process attack that you can't impose severe penalties. Uh, if we really wanted to hurt the regulated party, we'd file in court. Be my guest. Go ahead. Uh, that's perfectly fine. If, uh, if you think that's appropriate, the court can hear the First Amendment defense at that point, and you'd have an Article III judge deciding it. That the D.C. Circuit ultimately rejected Palm Wonderful's First Amendment claim is, of course, completely irrelevant. I, I'm not a lawyer for Palm Wonderful. Uh, I didn't, I never even heard of the product. The point is what they did, and my, my response to Michael is basically this. The Palm Wonderful case is a model for what I would allow. I would, I would allow the litigant to seek a declaratory judgment that uh, on its face the regulation or the sought after regulation violates the First Amendment and an injunction that uh, flows from it, and the, there's commercial fraud everywhere. Yeah, uh, life's tough and there's a jungle out there, but I, I think that doesn't mean the agency can't regulate knowingly false statements. That's not a justification for suppressing commercial speech uh, as a general matter. So we're, we're basically begging the question, because we don't know what, ex ante whether a particular speech is fraudulent or, or not. Thank you. Jonathan. I'll just say uh, a tiny bit. One, I, I do think one thing to, to keep in mind, certainly, in thinking about uh, Marty's proposal is that if the assumption is, is that agencies are largely going to enforce or take action based against action or speech that they believe is fr fraudulent or misleading is by filing court actions, um, that, that's not the end of the story, uh, right? We would still expect uh, many producers to go to agencies ahead of time because of fear of the cost of defending themselves against the federal government, against a federal agency going after them in court, to get the a sense of the from the agency, okay, what sorts of claims could we make or could we not make without risking prosecution by you? And if that's the sort of structure we had, I w one would hope that agencies would set up processes to regularize that sort of consultation, uh, perhaps even to, to allow uh, public input on that, and then companies would have the choice. Do they want to take the risk of just going out there and getting, uh, having an agency come after them, or, or do they want to be more risk averse and, and uh, seek uh, the, the agency's approval ahead of time? Uh, there are also, I should say, other uh, regulatory regimes. I know one that pro probably David does not like, um, but I think is, is certainly a step in the right direction for many of these sorts of questions is the way the FDA deals with uh, claims on nutritional supplements. 
uh, that is to say, uh, claims that can be substantiated, uh, but that the FDA has not approved, must be indicated uh, in such a, uh, must, that must be clearly indicated. Uh, and one of the reasons I prefer moving in that direction, not that that regime itself is perfect the way it's designed, is because what we know about the information environment is, is that government agencies generally are not very good at educating consumers about what consumers may want to know or may need to know. But those who have an economic interest in consumer knowledge are very effective at communicating that to information. And so what we don't want to lose in any of these contexts is the power of self-interested parties to educate consumers with information that can benefit consumers. And the problems with the way we deal with lots of these sorts of questions is that we are so concerned about potential for fraud, so concerned about the potential for consumers to be misled, is that we cut off the, uh, the ability of uh, producers to enrich consumer understanding of truthful things about products that may not only enhance consumer welfare, but in some cases may even uh, help consumers lead healthier lives or, 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 or save them from disease. David. So let me first address Marty's critique. Marty's critique is based on the idea that agencies are self-interested and that skews their decisional process. The Administrative Conference of the United States has studied the performance of ALJs repeatedly. This is in part an empirical question. Are, are, are litigants treated more fairly in court than they are before an administrative agency? The ALJ system has been around for a long time. ALJs are independent. The idea that they're not just flies in the face of established law. And so if you look at the work that ACUS has done over the years studying this question, they provide a refutation of Marty's basic premise, which is that someone who thinks that their First Amendment rights may be suppressed by an agency are necessarily going to do better in court with a fair, more independent um, trier fact uh, than they will at an agency. Uh, we've had administrative agencies. The FTC has been around for 100 years. This process has been around for 100 years. And when there is an enforcement case, the staff and the commission are separated. I don't talk to commissioners about matters that are subject to enforcement within the commission. In terms of Colleen, I think there's more, disagree more agreement than there is disagreement, but I think we see the issue differently. So Colleen points to very compelling cases where there ought to be accelerated approval processes and where the real problem is the timing of the revelation of the information. And she's right about that. The F FDA, during the AIDS crisis, developed a pathway, accelerated approvals, to get important drugs on the market as quickly as possible. And when you're dealing with, and I conceded when I started, that oncology is a, is a difficult issue because of the way the drug development works. But I think the answer is not to allow off-label promotion. It is to change the regulatory regime to use something like accelerated approval to get those approvals quickly and to allow the dissemination of that information more swiftly. The typical off-label promotion case has nothing to do with oncology drugs. Um, it has to do with a company trying to promote a product for an unapproved use simply because they can make more money. And, uh, and those are the kinds of cases that the Department of Justice brings enforcement actions against. There are still lots of cases brought by the Department of Justice making, uh, you know, making the claim that the company has promoted a, a drug for a use it's not uh, approved for. Um, and these settlements are quite substantial. And so when you talk about off-label promotion, I think it's important to keep in mind that the big cases, the important cases, are ones where a company pumps a drug for a use it's not approved. Um, and there is a risk to consumers, and there's a risk to the marketplace. Thank you, David. Sure. Colleen. DOJ brings actions that overwhelmingly never see the light of day because there's never a judge involved. Um, and, and most of them, so, so there's, a, there's a selection bias in what you're talking about. The, the, they're also, to the extent we have public information about those cases, um, there's a, a, a pretty clear pattern of the government 
um, taking cases without caring one iota whether the underlying speech is accurate and without paying any attention even to what FDA thinks about the public health consequences of, of pursuing the investigation. Um, I also want to say what I intended to say when I first stood up and then got distracted by the conversation about off-label promotion, which I didn't think we were going to have today. Um, I, I said at the end of my comments before that I think having the option to go to an ALJ is useful. Um, and I said that sometimes these cases end up in federal court and that that's useful. And I alluded to the Ameren case and Pasira and a couple of others that, that have ended up in the Second Circuit. Um, if there were a way to do that more easily, uh, I think that that would bring a, a level of prayerfulness into FDA's decision making um, that, that is in excess of even what we have now. The, the litigation environment in this manufacturer speech arena over the last five years in particular has been very helpful in getting the career folks at FDA and the lawyers to focus on the need to get these evaluative decisions done well and done quickly. And if there is any way to further improve upon the system by um, making more available access to prompt judicial review, um, that, would, that would further uh, advantage the system and ultimately um, patient welfare. Uh, the only other thing that I want to add is um, even if you could, as David suggests, accelerate the process, um, you would run into, and there are a lot of reasons why it's hard to do that, that you would run into at least three um, deeply problematic ideological biases within FDA, which are scientific. Uh, one is the, the, the slave, slavish adherence to the p-value. So the notions of statistical significance are, are, are very hard to um, unseat. The Oncology Center of Excellence within FDA is working on doing that. And Mark McClellan did a great job of pushing the use of adaptive trial designs and Bayesian statistics, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. FDA still makes judgments about clinical significance, how much of a clinical benefit observed in a trial is enough to warrant approval, and then relatedly, risk benefit, how much risk should we allow, should we allow patients at the population level to tolerate? Uh, I'm not sure folks realize how much of a role FDA plays in, in, in standing in all our shoes and deciding on all our behalf whether we would tolerate um, the, the, the risks associated with the use of a particular therapy, even in the presence of a serious or life-threatening illness. And there are folks who've been at the agency, in some cases, in one notable case, um, since before I was born, <laughs> uh, who are committed to traditional statistical analytical methods and the, and the p-value, who take very conservative positions on clinical significance and very conservative positions on risk benefit. And, and if you really want to make this scheme contemporary and more responsive to um, societal and patient interests, you will look at those cognitive biases that currently infect the system, too. Thank you very much. Um, on account of our panelists' admirable discipline and my sheer brilliance, we do, in fact, have 20 minutes for audience <laughs> questions and uh, discussions. Um, there are microphones out there. Please raise your hand um, and wait for the microphone. And uh, once you have the microphone, briefly identify yourself. And I would greatly appreciate if your questions were actually questions. We'll start with the gentleman in the back. And then we'll move up here. Uh, my name is Daniel Berninger. I'm an entrepreneur. I have a free speech versus the administrative state case uh, at the Supreme Court right now, Daniel Berninger versus FCC. Um, the part about the comment uh, versus question, I have to reframe my comment as a question, but um, just briefly, I wanted to amplify um, what Professor Reddish was saying. Is, it was, why is it that I am brought a lawsuit against the FCC uh, on First Amendment grounds? And my sense is what happened in, in the interaction with the regulated agency is that they ended up with a presumption of innocence and I ended up with a presumption of guilt. That over 80 years that the FCC did its regulatory 
um, activities, they were never held accountable for the outcome of those activities. Um, I'm a founder of a number of companies, including uh, Vonage, and for a long, long time, we were able to pursue startups with a presumption of innocence as long as it was involving information technology. And what happened in the open internet order was it was flipped that the regulated, regulated agency had the presumption that it could regulate anything in the internet um, and entrepreneurs like myself had to prove what we were doing uh, was in the public interest. Um, so I, I don't quite know if I managed to comment that, or a question. We'll go to the gentleman up front here. Mike Doherty here, I'm the CEO of LabMD. Um, I, you do have a question, right? I have a question, don't worry. I, I see your anxiety rising and my seconds are flipping. Uh, so uh, what, do, what do you make of uh, Mr. Reddish and Mr. Vladek? Uh, Josh Wright's uh, paper in 13 that said, in the past nearly 20 years, the FTC has ruled in favor of staff on appeal 100% of the time. And, and, but the win rate for antitrust plaintiffs appealing from district court is closer to 50. So, because I don't think the, and here's my comment actually, the ALJs are not the issue. They are independent, but they're also impotent. Because it's, a, it's an exercise in weaponization against people to drag them through the process, calling them millions of years, and countless bad press releases from the FTC. Then you get to an Article III court if you can survive it that long. And that's the game, because the commission's going to overturn an independent ALJ at the FTC so far every time. Except since this came out, we do have one tie. Marty or David or I'm, anybody. I'm not familiar with that paper you said, Josh Wright uh, yeah. in 2013. That sounds like it would be very helpful. I, I should say that I know a number of ALJs who do not feel independent at all. In fact, they organized a union. If, if they were sufficiently independent in their agencies, I don't see why they would need to have a union. Yeah. Well, I only have one experience of one, so. Yeah, and I'm not going to comment on the LabMD case. <laughs> you do all the time otherwise, David. I don't know why you stopped now. I do, I do think that this, <laughs> this notion of um, regulation by press release is, is interesting. Um, I, I have been involved in a number of cases on behalf of an individual client who, um, among other things, sued the Department of Justice under the Data Quality Act, um, which I know is near and dear to many people uh, in this room, if not on this panel. And, and the, the, the case resulted in um, the, the unfortunate conclusion that when DOJ proceeds by press release, uh, that that's not reviewable under the Data Quality Act or under background APA principles. So I, it, it, we, if you're just trying to figure out what an informational system should look like that's, that, that serves the values that, are, that it should serve, it's, it strikes me as a, a little bit of an anomaly that you can have individuals and uh, primarily individuals um, held accountable under under fraud doctrine for what they say in a press release and yet there isn't even judicial review when the government um, includes demonstrably false statements in, in in a press release which is what we had in our situation so that kind of imbalance and anomaly has always really really troubled me another question yes sir yeah, hi, I'm Lewis Grossman, and I'm a professor of law at American University and a food and drug expert. And I have what I hope will be provocative questions for Colleen, and then for David, and Jonathan might want to chime in on the question for David. Starting with Colleen, just to clarify for our audience, you were representing a, a world which, in, in which almost no communications allowed. It's worth uh, elaborating that actually a fair amount of pre-approval off-label um, uh, promotion or at least scientific communication is, is allowed now. And so it's not you know, partly under the force of First Amendment uh, litigation. And so I just want to, you know, I wanted you to have a chance to, to make that clear. But the question is, um, it seems to me that when we're talking about the public interest in restricting such speech, uh, the public interest that, is, that you didn't mention and that, uh, and that uh, Coronia case didn't mention, but that should be mentioned more often, is that we want people to do clinical studies of these off-label uses. And it seems to me one of the 
big paradoxes or quandaries is the more you allow companies to promote their off-label uses based on, for example, um, you know, a small phase two uh, study with positive indicators, uh, the less they have an incentive to actually go ahead and do the two uh, phase three trials, which are ordinarily the basis for, for approval of, a, of an NDA. For David, I want you to reflect a little bit on the possibility, uh, which has sometimes been implemented, for example, with uh, qualified health claims, in uh, disclaimers as opposed to prohibition of speech. Um, why shouldn't a, uh, a person communicating to consumers be able to say whatever they want to say so long as it is, it is framed in a way that is simply true? One week study has shown that blah, 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 and FDA has not approved this claim. I ask my students, what if you sold water and you said, although no scientist in the world uh, believes that this should be sold as a cure for arthritis, mystics insist it works for that purposes. Why shouldn't you be able to do that? I'm wondering whether uh, um, you, you have anything to say about that. Thanks. It's a lot, Lou. Um, <laughs> So, so, like, I have a four-hour presentation on the safe harbors that I'll no, not, not now. <laughs> but, but, um, but the punchline is, yeah, in principle, there are these safe harbors. There are four of them. They're constitutionally bound, but you know, but they're not they're not terribly meaningful because, as we've been asking FDA to concede since 2011 in the citizen petitions that we filed, they just, there need to be clear operatory rules that kind of define the scope of those safe harbors. Um, so, so yeah, in theory. Uh, but also, I, I, I separately want to just put a pin in, the, I mean, promotional speech should be allowed. It's not an answer to the constitutional problem to say, yeah, but you can talk over here through these people in these ways the government finds palatable. Um, on the rationale for restrictions, FDA has, that, that's one of the two things that FDA and DOJ have always said, we want people to do clinical studies. My view is you can't hold people to ransom. You know, you can't, you can't say, well, we want you to behave in the following way and we're going to manipulate the informational environment to get the behavior that we want. Um, and, and, that, and that's, I mean, that's really at the heart of what FDA does. The, what the agency does in the drug arena is control that real estate, that package insert, that labeling. Um, as a way of eliciting prescribing and, and product use and um, decision making that it agrees with. So it will even go so far in, in, in isolated cases uh, um, as to lie. <laughs> it makes a policy decision to say something that is not true in a package insert in order to elicit the behavior that it wants. And that's what we saw with the suicidality language in SSRIs back in 2004, and that's just one example. Um, and then you have the, D the DC Circuit evaluation of like the salience rationale for the, for the cigarette health claim, the graphic warnings, I mean that kind of goes to pulling on someone's heartstrings to get them to act the way you want them to act. Always been very troubled by that, but that is an animating policy uh, of the agency is to use information to elicit behavior that, that the agency um, likes. Uh, on the phase three studies point, uh, oh and by the way, it's not always feasible to do these studies. I mean, you can't get, there's so much competition for patients. Take Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. They're a very small, highly vulnerable patient population. These kids really just, you know, there are not that many of them, and there's fortunately a lot of drug development going on, but there are only so many studies you can populate, and does that mean you just want to not, you know, pursue these programs, or do you put the agency in the position of picking which development program it wants to shunt patients towards? It just creates all kinds of complexity. Interestingly, we, we, we looked, um, my team looked at all B1 NDAs, so all truly innovative NDAs, not, not just enemies, but all B1s since 1997 to see how many FDA actually required two adequate and well-controlled studies for. Um, and, and there's the Sazanowski you know, hypothesis that it's really all about orphan, it's not. I mean, it, it, it's about the level of confidence that FDA brings into the assessment. And in fully, fully one in 10 cases of, of B1s, the agency lets the manufacturer get away with something significantly short of two adequate and well-controlled clinical trials. Um, and in oncology, of course, it's, it's dramatically less and enzyme replacement dramatically less. So it's not the case that there's sort of one size fits all in terms of the level of substantiation required. The very, very last thing I'll say is the government, I, th I think the orthodoxy is the government always wins on prong one, Central Hudson, and, and FDA is sort of uh, known to say, well, of course, it's a substantial government interest. I've never, I've never bought that because, of course, you have so many products where the, the drug approval process 
um, should be invoked, but FDA doesn't require it to be invoked. So how do you explain, you know, all of the drugs that, for historical reasons, have never been the subject of a call for NDAs? FDA just accepts that all of these products are fine because they've been on the market for a long time and for price reasons has an incentive not to require them to go through the NDA process because it doesn't want the manufacturer to take price. Um, so there's an incoherence under Greater New Orleans Broadcasting. You would think that the government would be worried about its litigation vulnerability on that point. You can't sort of over here, you know, say that the, that the drug approval process is the end all be all and then over here say, but only when we think it is. There's sort of a, there's a, um, a, a, a caprice in the way the agency sort of invokes this this rationale um, that, that troubles me from a, a, a prong one perspective. David. Well, <laughs> it's a lot to, um, to respond to. Uh, let me make two quick points. One is Colleen's examples about off-label use involve companies that are engaged in phase three trials. They just haven't finished them and so forth. Again, the key point to this discussion is those are not the run-of-the-mill off-label use cases. The run-of-the-mill cases are the ones that the Department of Justice pursues or private litigants pursue because there is no adequate science to back up the claim. David, you're just wrong. All right, well, wrong, okay, well, that's, that's, that's why look, this, this policy conversation has become so dysfunctional is because that, that theme keeps getting strong and it's just... Uh, well, then why do the, com data, why do the company settle forward. these cases? Because I mean, <laughs> no, these are big... Anyway, look, look, look. So, all I can say is if you look at the cases that are filed, most of them involve situations very different than Colleen is describing. To get to your question about disclaimers, the problem with disclaimers, and this comes back to the Pearson case where the... Where the the DC Circuit basically took your position, which is if you, can, if you can make a claim, but make it true by using disclaimers, that is the preferred First Amendment so, a solution to the problem, right? And so the question then becomes, how has that worked in, in the marketplace? And the DC Circuit in Pearson leaves a, basically an opening and says, look, we don't want disclaimers to bewilder consumers. And so the, the disclaimer you described I think the DC Circuit would have said, yes, this is the classic example of what we don't think is going to help consumers. To the extent there's been studies about this, many of the disclaimers that are currently used, for example, on dietary sops or on other products, bewilder consumers. The longer the, the, longer the disclaimer, the more the consumer thinks that the product actually delivers whatever benefits that's been promised. And so, you know, I, 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 you know, I understand Jonathan's point. Um, that's really where his, his paper ends up, as I read it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think the real question is, when are we going to have sufficient evidence about the utility of disclaimers and the extent to which they actually serve the purpose for which they're intended? If there's evidence that they do that, I think I'm on Jonathan's side. If there's evidence that they more bewilder than educate, well, then I think John, there's a problem with Jonathan's argument. We will take two more questions that have already been out there. Um, one, did you have your hand up earlier, Professor Volok, or is this a new contribution? He, Eugene. <laughs> okay, and I, I want to take the questions together, okay, and then give the panelists a, a last response. Uh, quick one, uh, James Cooper, I teach here at Scalia Law. Uh, this is to David, uh, just because he probably thought the most about this, but happy to hear what anyone else has to say. I'm just curious. Um, what do you think the, if, if in, you know, the First Amendment limitations, maybe after Sorrell, are on uh, pri privacy, uh, privacy regulation or enforcement at the FTC or, say, FCC? Okay, and Eugene. Uh, yeah, Eugene Volokh. Uh, UCLA. So I've been studying uh, libel uh, recent months, and boy, there's a huge, huge problem out there. People are being accused of libel, and I think a lot of them really are guilty of libel. Uh, it could be people libeling their exes. It's a lot of times in a commercial context where people are, li where consumers are libeling somebody. Sometimes there's sort of some overlay, at least a legation of basically extortion. I'm gonna post this nasty review of you, uh, and maybe I'll take it down, but the implicit message is only if you give me my money back or something like that. 
So it's a huge problem out there, and there's no doubt that the existing court system is a weak way of dealing with it. So my question to you, David, is what if somebody were to say, we ought to have a reputation protection agency out there? It will be a federal agency or a state agency, where if somebody accuses someone of libel, they'll be investigated by a reputation protection agency, and there'll be a decision by an ALJ who could order the removal of this material. And I ask this because there is a vast problem out there, and there's no doubt that the cost and the delay of the existing judicial system is, uh, is not, uh, makes it not really equipped to deal with the problem. At the same time, I guess my sense is that the agency solution would cause us to balk for many of the same reasons that Marty identifies. So my question is, what do you think? And maybe one answer is, well, one's commercial speech and one's not, but it's not completely clear exactly how satisfying that distinction ought to be here. All right, so I agree with you that the, 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 you know, the, the distinction has never been clear cut, which has you know, baffled us all for quite some time. Um, I, I would not want to work for that agency, um, and I want, wouldn't want to be an ALJ um, to resolve those uh, you know, completely private claims. Um, and I would wonder why, why the government was interceding. If the court system set up a separate court to handle defamation cases, that might be a better way to address your solution. Because you go back to Crowell, you go back to the fo foundational administrative law cases, the government really doesn't have any business adjudicating purely p private claims. And, and, and it's not clear to me what how extensive the government's interest in you maintaining your, re your reputation is. But what I would urge you to consider is to have a branch of the court system. New York City, New York State has, com has created commercial courts to get commercial litigants into a special court that moves quicker, that has more sophisticated um, decisional tools. Why not a defamation court where people who uh, claim that they've been libeled can go in there's a set of procedures, there's expedited discovery. Um, you're in California, the home of, you know, of all libel cases. Uh, maybe the California courts sh should do that. Um, and, and let me quickly answer James's question. I, I don't know what Sorrell really implies for anything. Um, you know, it was argued on the last day. It was an opinion that doesn't make much sense to anybody. Um, I don't think I don't think Sorrell really helps us understand the limits of what companies that harvest personal data really can do about them and do with that data, um, or what agencies like the Federal Trade Commission ought to think about regulation in that space. Um, you know, Sorrell simply says. Uh, in, I, view, I read it as a viewpoint discrimination case. If, if data is going to be available in the marketplace for one actor, it has to be available for all actors, which strikes me as a sensible rule. Um, but I don't, I'm, you know, I, there's been a lot of thought given to your question, and I have not seen anyone have a good answer to it. Okay, can Ladies I just and gentlemen. Add, oh, can I just so. add one point on, on David's response to Eugene? You may have missed the, the, the subtext of Eugene's question, oh, unless, unless I'm just projecting. But I, <laughs> I thought the point was if you don't feel comfortable having an agency handle those kinds of First Amendment claims in the first instance, how come you have no problem at all with agencies handling other First Amendment claims in the, in the first instance? Maybe we'll that isn't where you were going, Eugene, oh, I'm, but I, I thought that We'll sort exactly, that out over the break. I thought that was exactly where Eugene was going. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the panel for a terrific discussion.